Hi there, my name is Ivo Littercast, and welcome to my podcast, Grimdark Book Club. This podcast is for anyone passionate about the grimdark fiction genre, from the Horus Heresy to the Winds of War, when it does finally come out. We are going to dissect all of it. Expect a new post each month that dissects and reviews a new book. And uh, my current project is actually to read every book in the Horus Heresy series. Um, it's over 50 books. But don't worry, for those of you who don't like 40k, I promise I will be sprinkling in plenty of books from other fandoms. Um, and I also won't be reviewing every single book in the Horse Heresy series, only the ones that I thought were, like, absolutely fantastic and worth spending the time to really break down and talk about. Um, of course, I really want to review stories that we all enjoy, so please, if you have any suggestions, make them. Subscribers are automatically entered in a drawing to win a free book every month. So yeah, that is everything. Let's get started. Today we are reviewing the first three books in the Horus Heresy, which are Horus Rising, False Gods, and Galaxy in Flames. And I'm doing all three together because I think they actually work better as a single book than as three separate ones. And the reasoning for that is because if you ask me, this is my personal opinion, the first book in particular is ridiculously slow and very dense and kind of dry. It's like a scone. It's like if you're eating a scone and you don't have anything like jelly or jam or lemon curd to put on it, so you're just kind of like sitting there chewing and chewing and chewing and your mouth is really dry. Um, but it's all super important and it's basically the exposition that sets up the rest of everything. It's a very important book. I didn't want to skip that book and I wanted to review the second and third books, so I figured let's go ahead and mush them into one. So each of these books was actually written by a different author. We have in order Dan Abnett, Graham McNeil, and Ben Counter, and their writing styles are actually pretty distinctive when you like read them one after the other, but each of these guys end up returning to write more stories in the Horus Heresy, so their voices end up carrying pr through pretty far um, into the whole book series. And honestly, my favorite out of the three was Ben Counter. I'm not sure if it's just that he got the better storyline or the um, <laughs> more exciting part of these three books, or if it was his actual writing style, um, but I will say I didn't always appreciate the way, in particular, uh, Dan Abnett wrote female characters. Um, and again, this is all just me talking, basically, about the books, right, and my feelings. Everybody has their own opinions, and I would love to hear them. Um, but let's get further into the breakdown, kind of, of what these books are. What are they about? So the genre. The entire Horus Heresy series is classified as grimdark. Surprise, surprise, welcome to the Grimdark Book Club. Even though, um, in my opinion, you wouldn't exactly know that you are reading a grimdark story until the second or third book in. Um, unless you already knew about Warhammer. Um, but that brings me to their intended audience. So we all know that Black Library only really started taking off in the past 15 years or so. So it could be assumed that the audience um, for the stories were initially meant um, to be people who already knew about Warhammer and who really just wanted to get deeper into the lore. Obviously that's changed, especially within the past 15 years or so, maybe even less, but for those of you who are subscribed to the Warhammer newsletter, they're pushing the books a lot more. And I like that. That makes me excited because that's the type of stuff that I'm into. Games Workshop, they really want to get more people excited about the universe, excited about playing and painting and building, um, and really being a community. And Black Library is an excellent means to reach people like me who are less interested in actually playing the game and more interested in reading the stories of the people who exist within the 40k and uh, Age of Sigmar universes um, and watching the games be played. And of course, with all of that in mind, like all the information I just gave you, these first three books really were geared toward um, the adults who enjoy reading science fiction and grimdark fiction with a militaristic theme. Like, that kind of boils down every, just about every book in the Horus Heresy series is, it is grimdark, it is science fiction, it has um, a militaristic theme. Some of them could technically be, like, breach into the horror genre, and 
We'll get into those. Uh, obviously, I'm going to be touching on them because I love horror. I would say Flight of the Eisenstein fits into that actually pretty well. But the books are also especially geared toward people who want to find out exactly what happened in pre-40k times that led to things being the way they were or are now in the 41st millennium. So let's go on to my rating of these books. So overall, I actually give these first three books a collective 6.3 out of 10, and that doesn't sound big, but I took an average of my ratings for each individual book. So for the first book, Horus Rising, um, I actually gave it a 3 out of 10. It took me literal months to get through that book, and I don't take months to read books, um, especially if I'm listening to them on Audible. Like, the only other book that I've read so far through Audible that has taken me literal months to read was Helter Skelter, um, and that's just because that's a hefty, hefty book with a lot of information. So, yeah. The second book, though, False Gods, is where it starts to pick up. I, I gave it a 5 out of 10, um, and the third, Galaxy in Flames, to me was a 9 out of 10, and I'm only giving it a 9 out of 10 instead of a 10 out of 10 because there are books that come later that are even better than Galaxy in Flames. But to me, the peak part of Galaxy in Flames was actually really the final scenes of it that just made it stick in my mind so vibrantly. Now, me giving a 3 out of 10 and a 5 out of 10 to the first two books does not reflect whether or not I think you should read them. I think you should read them, period, end of discussion. If you are into Warhammer, you should read The Horus Heresy. Like, that is my feeling on it. All of them. Every single book, even the ones that are a little bit of a drag to get through because they build they build a foundation for the later books that are like poof, explosion. Like all of my favorite books in the Horus Heresy wouldn't make sense without the context of the other books that kind of happen in between them. So um, let's give a summary, and this is going to be long. <laughs> um, I'm actually chopping this podcast into two episodes because it's going to be a long summary, and then I'm going to go into more detail on talking about like my thoughts and opinions on, on everything. So it's going to be long. I will be using uh, information gathered obviously from reading the books, but some of these, the information that I'm including here uh, was stuff that I didn't pluck out of my head. I actually used the internet. The website I used the most which was https colon forward slash forward slash wh40k.lexicanicum.com. There are also going to be spoilers. Just so if you don't want spoilers, Turn the podcast off now, you have 10 seconds before it gets started. Um, come back at another time. <laughs> uh, so 10 seconds starting now. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right, here we go. So in book one, we are introduced to several characters. We meet three Primarchs, Horus, Rogaldorn, and Sanguinius. Um, we actually also meet several Luna Wolves, including Garviel, Loken, um, the other three characters who are in the Mournival long term, and Malaghurst. And then there are some Emperor's Children, and people from a few other legions, and some Remembrancers. The Remembrancers end up having a really big part to play, but they don't really start to become a major part of the story until later. They're more like accessories um, up until probably halfway through the second book. The main character of these books is technically Garviel Loken, but by the end of this trilogy, the starting three books, um, the focus includes Remembrancers Kirill Sinderman, Euphrates Keeler, and Mercedes Olten. It also focuses on some character development from some other characters that are either introduced in this first book or the second book. Um, and a lot happens in this first book, but it boils down to Loken getting accepted into Horus's inner circle discovering the existence of lodges in the Astartes ranks, learning about the warp through a freak accident, um, and then attempting to come to terms with the nuances of all of those things while still maintaining his humanity. And his humanity is kind of what everybody seems to be like lauding and praising him for uh, as the reason why he's a good addition to the Mornival, which is Horus's inner circle of Astartes. In addition to that, we also meet the Megarachnids, which is a Xenos species, as well as the Interx humans, um, which the Astartes inevitably wipe out both of those. Um, and we also get the first few hints of the cult forming based around the Lactitio Divinitatis. Um, and the Luna Wolves change their names to the Son of Hor Sons of Horus in this book, 
Um, also, a galaxy-shaking semi-sentient weapon called the Anathame is stolen from the Interex Museum of, like, violent weapons. Um, and the Vengeful Spirit, which is Horus's ship, uh, moves on toward the moon Davin. So that's, you know, kind of just a very, very vague <laughs> recap of the first book. Um, and the main purpose of this book is actually to set the stage for the next two books. It took me, like I mentioned, actual months to read through this whole book because, let's face it, it's really, really dry. It's all exposition with a very little bit of action and the smallest dose of intrigue. That said, it's still very much worth the read because you end up meeting most of the key players throughout the first three books of this 50 plus book series and many of the events you read later on in other books that are not directly, like, after this trilogy actually link back to the events that happen in this very first book right here. Um, and if you're wondering, you know, why the 41st millennium is the way that it is, this book is the start of the explanation. You need to have this beginning piece in order to understand the rest. Um, it really gives us a feel for the culture within the Luna Wolves, uh, which later become known as the Sons of Horus. And while I agree the writers were still um, finding their footing during the first three books, they did a really decent, at least, at least a decent job of illustrating what Brotherhood looks like to Astartes. Um, that said, <laughs> this first book, it really felt to me like, uh, I believe Dan Abnett worked on the first book, um, Horus Rising. It felt like to me he wasn't really sure how to write camaraderie and brotherhood in the sense of Astartes because um, they were almost, it almost gave the vibe of them being romantically involved. That did not take away from the story for me, and I'll go into that a little bit later. So book two, False Gods, is actually broken into four parts. And this book is much easier to enjoy right off the bat compared to Horus Rising. Um, we actually are briefly introduced to Magnus the Red in this book. There's a character development for Malaghurst, Abaddon, Torgaddon, uh, Little Horus, Aximand, and Loken, and as well as the Remembrancers, actually. And I enjoyed that. This is also the book where we begin to see Horus start to kind of come unraveled. So the battle that takes place on Davin, where Horus faces down the warp monstrosity that was once his friend, and Loken and Torgaddon um, and their men fight off god-awful <laughs> warp zombie Astartes, is some spectacular imagery I will not soon forget. During this fight, Horus is actually badly wounded by the Anathame, wielded by his warp-ridden friend, um, and the Astartes end up trampling a bunch of common folk on their way to take Horus to the Apothecary. So right out the gate, it is just drama, drama, drama. And um, because the Primarchs have special unknowable anatomy, the Apothecaries actually can't really help Horus, so he gives his valedictions to a Remembrancer uh, that they recently picked up off of Davin. Um, and that, that actually sets the stage for some drama later, but basically he reveals like a bunch of secrets to this chick. Like, a lot of them, and it's not good. Um, now obviously Horus survives, but only because of the magic wielded by a warrior lodge on Davin. Um, I believe they're like the serpents, or the snakes or something. And all of these events seem to have been orchestrated to happen, like, like, almost everything happened too smooth, in my opinion. Because the ritual that takes place over Horus is what inevitably leads him to betray the Emperor. So as he's being healed, he ends up being transported to the warp, basically, and has this whole encounter where the gods show him this like potential future, and he's not being worshipped as a god, but everybody else is, and basically just tell him, like, Daddy abandoned you, and, you know, it's... It's not great. It is not great for him, but it's some really powerful imagery. Very well written. Um, but also while he's being healed, some of the Remembrancers accidentally summon a demon while translating the Book of Lorgar. And Euphrates Keeler, she's one of the Remembrancers, she ends up accidentally channeling the Emperor's power to save them all before she collapses into a coma. That's pretty, pretty exciting right there. And actually, that was the most mind-blowing part of the entire book. Um, I've reread it actually a few times just to get as much detail as I can from it into my brain, because it was really a work of art the way it was written. Um, 
And then Horus leads his 63rd expedition to a new goal after he's recovered, and they meet the uh, Arishan technoc technocracy. Goodness, that's say that ten times fast. Um, and basically just kill them outright uh, under the pretense of some kind of assassination attempt in order to seize a tool that they have called an STC. Um, but they're basically, they're highly valuable and they store like all of this like really important knowledge and he promises them uh, the STCs to uh, adept Regulus of the Mechanicum um, in exchange for their support uh, for his plan to overthrow the Emperor. And during this time, the Anatheme also ends up with Fulgrim, who has his own book later on, and that sword plays a really important part in that book as well. Um, and then Angron and his World Eaters actually help Horus and his sons violently dispatch the Eretians without prejudice. I was shocked. I was not ready. I was not, I was not ready for that whole thing to happen, and it was, it was awesome. Um, that said, anything with Angron in it? Man, I really am not Angron's biggest fan. I don't think anyone is, and whoever is, like, good on you, you found a Primarch you like. He reminds me of my bio dad a little bit, so... Not, again, not the biggest fan of him. Anyway, so then at the end of the book, uh, Ignace Carcassi, who is one of the key remembrancers in this story, he's actually murdered. Um, and it, it's painted to look like suicide. Um, and the Remembrancer who took Horus's valediction is also mur murdered. Um, and Loken and Targadon team up, and, and the Mournival is officially split down the middle, um, as the 63rd heads toward the Istvan system. So Book 3, Galaxy in Flames, is kind of the book you... It's really, it is, it is, of these three, it is the book you cannot put down. In less than a week, I devoured it. I would have given this book a 10 out of 10 if I hadn't read more Black Library books that I thought were even better than this one. Um, so let's get into it. So in this book, we finally actually meet my favorite Primarch, Morty, uh, Mortarion, and my favorite Death Guard character, Nathaniel Garrow, and the Remembrancers, Euphrates Keeler, Kirill Sinderman, and Mercedes Olsen actually play really big roles in this book instead of just being quasi-secondary characters, and I like that. I like that they shifted the focus a little bit more. Um, so Horus has four Primarchs on his side at this point, and they need to clean house in their legions. So they arrive at the Istvan system, and they're supposedly there to crush a rebellion that's occurring on the planet. Um, but yeah, that's not what's going to happen. So the book starts off with some really epic scenes taking place on the Vengeful Spirit, uh, one of which involves Euphrates Keeler, now hailed as a prophet waking up from her coma as Cinderman and two of his allies try to transport her to a safer place, and she casts some sort of spell on their uh, pursuer, the person chasing them, and about to kill them, um, and the spell makes it so that he can barely move, and his bullets fire in slow motion. I was not expecting any of this stuff to be, like, as mystical and exciting as it was. I should put in at some point. I had no information about Warhammer before I started reading these books. None. So all of these things, as I'm experiencing them, are like brand new and exciting and unexpected. And so that's, that is the lens through which I have like been reading all of the books. Um, I think that colors my perspective on some things. Um, right, but so they've arrived at Isvan Extremis, and Captain Garrow is badly wounded by something called a war singer, but another Astarte Lord Commander, Eidolon, is actually able to kill the war singer with a sonic shriek, ah, um, thanks to a curious member of the Legion, Salt Harvis. <clears throat> uh, now, so when I first read that, I was really perplexed, because I was like, wait, they're not supposed to be altering anything anatomy-wise. Um, but as I continued to read, there was actually a character called Saul Tarvitz who got curious about that, and he ended up, like, basically the story takes us to a laboratory where an apothecary is making surgical enhancements on Legion members. And this seems strange to include at this point in time to me, um, but it does get touched on again as a key point in another book. So I'm glad they planted that seed there, because we come back to it later. Um, but it's not really touched on too much further in this book. 
Uh, so then Horus sends an assault force to Istvan, and that force includes Loken and Torgaddon, but not the other two uh, members of the Mournival. So that guy Tarvitz I talked about earlier, he actually is the one who finds out Horus's plan <laughs> to kill his own Astartes on Istvan's surface. And um, the cooperation of the other Primarchs, the same end. Like, he kind of just becomes aware of all of it at the same time by following a hunch. And he manages to find an ally in Nathaniel Garrow of the Death Guard, who was chilling on the Eisenstein due to his injuries. They had been friends from a previous uh, battle or something. They knew each other. And Garrow listens and believes Tarvitz that, like, all of this stuff is about to happen. So he actually helps cover for Tarvitz as Tarvitz takes a drop pod and descends to the surface without any kind of permission to warn the Astartes there of the impending danger. Um, and then Garrow actually jumps into the warp. We don't see him jump into the warp in this book, we see him prepare to. And then you have Flight of the Eisenstein, which tacks onto this book. That is possibly my favorite book of all time, Flight of the Eisenstein. And that's saying something because I've read a lot of books. Um, Right, so then, um, Gar uh, excuse me, Tarvitz, he lands uh, on the surface, and there's the Sons of Horus, the World Eaters, Emperor's Children, Death Guard, all of these parts of these legions who are deemed by their own Primarchs to be too loyal to the Emperor to live. Um, and then Euphrates Keeler receives a vision of what is about to unfold on Esvan and tells Olatin and Sinderman, and then most of the uh, forces on Esvan, like, basically almost in the same instant, they die by virus bombs, and then the following orbital, orbital strike that ignites the gas in the atmosphere and burns the entire planet kind of takes care of almost the rest of everybody else. Um, so recordings of that are broadcast uh, to all the Remembrancers on the Vengeful Spirit who have been gathered into a single room basically to be massacred. And thankfully, Cinderman, Olsen, and Keeler managed to escape alongside a sympathetic and elderly third captain named Yaktong Cruz. And we see the four of these get away. Like, these four people just poof, gone. And we don't really hear much about them for a really long time, but I anticipate that they end up having, I haven't finished reading the series, but I anticipate that they end up having more, uh, we'll call it screen time, uh, later on in later books. And if not, then that's an absolute waste of some, some excellent characters. Um, but at this point, <laughs> Horus loses control over what's going on on Isfan, because Angron, Ugh, I don't like him. He drops down um, with his world leaders to basically attack anyone who survived the two death blows there. And the two sides of the Mornival end up facing off, to the, facing off to the death, and basically it is just a bloody mess, and it seems like every loyalist dies. Obviously we find out much later that there were survivors, um, but I'm not going to go into that right now. I want to kind of leave y'all in suspense a little bit. Um, and the final scenes show Abaddon full-fledged, like, angry that Loken and, um, Torgaddon didn't side with Horus. Um, and then we've got Aximand, who is, like, super depressed from having to kill, like, his best friend Torgaddon, who I kind of shipped with. Like, I kind of shipped them. I'm not gonna lie. Um, and then Loken actually kind of gets buried beneath the rubble of a building that happened to still be standing after this bombardment, um, where he was facing off to the death uh, against his brothers. Um, and that's kind of it. Like, that is the end of that book. And uh, my description obviously is very lackluster and, and doesn't do it nearly any justice, because that book, I'm telling you, I ate it up. I, I read that book in like three days. Um, my one sentence summation would be... Okay, so that was a lot and I really regret having to make it one sentence, but basically I would submit it as it was the three books, right? Were really well written, um, very layered tale of Horace's misguided descent into pure chaos. 
Um, but I like that they focus not just on Horace, but on these smaller but key characters, because that's what makes the story more than just a retelling of lore, right? It makes it intriguing and relatable. It helps you experience it alongside those characters. Right, so that was part one <laughs> of this podcast episode. I'm going to do part two next. We're going to talk about um, my character commentary, my plot commentary, the TLDR version of this entire thing, um, and that's, that's going to be the conclusion of this episode. So thank you for listening to part one. I'm going to go ahead and insert my usual podcast show ending here at the end of this, but just keep in mind we've got a part two coming up uh, very, very soon. So thank you, and uh, peace out. I'll be posting a new episode on the second Friday or Saturday of every month, and you can find me on whatever platform you use to listen to your podcasts. Each episode will also be available in video format on YouTube, as well as text format on my blog at ilettercast.com. If you want the links to all of those, as well as each new podcast, um, just subscribe to my weekly newsletter at ilettercast.com under the link titled Get Free Books. You can also subscribe to my Instagram account at I underscore lettercast, my Twitter account at iLettercast, and my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash iLettercast. I really look forward to sharing this and other exciting podcasts with you every single month. And uh, I'll see you real soon.